So first of all, Chris, congratulations on the book. And it is already getting a lot of attention here in South Dakota. Yeah, thank you, Lori. I appreciate it. I'm excited. To say, I was excited to uh, sort of appear as an alumni in the Rapid City Journal and then the Argus. Uh, so, so yeah, those are two of my favorite South Dakota newspapers uh, right after the Hill City Prevailer. So <laughs> hopefully I'll make that one as well. And now you live in Washington, D.C., but you've taken a little bit of, well, you've taken more than a little bit of South Dakota with you. Tell us a little bit about that transition. And now, especially as the book comes out and it's a South Dakota book, you're promoting it at home. Yeah. You're home. Are you homesick? Oh, yeah, totally. No, we have a, we have like a wall drug. I, I say that at some point in the book, we have a wall drug sign on our, like the floor of our home, like, or like the, you know, the, the, like the main wall of our house. And I, I actually, my wife, um, we moved out to D.C. in 2017 before I had picked up my actual, my, my, um, I was still working for Courthouse News at the time. So kind of the middle of when the project had started. And then I got out here, I couldn't find work um, in journalism. And so the Rapid City Journal offered me a job. And so I moved back to South Dakota after I kind of had a draft of the collection done, but then living and working in West River, as most folks know, was quite inspiring. And so a number of the poems came from my Rapid City Journal time as well as the Courthouse News time. And so I uh, worked, I was there for about a, a little less than a year. And then I was back out to DC in January of 2019, where we've been for two years. And now with the pandemic, we've just been kind of, you know, more like sort of purists about being here. Um, yeah. But uh, I still, you know, there's a, there's like a South Dakota diaspora who, who is in DC. So we're sort of plugged into folks. In fact, just last Friday night, we were, um, out socially distancing for drinks uh, at an outdoor establishment uh, with a guy from Oldham. And so that was, that was fun. <laughs> the people who aren't from South Dakota who know you, what do they think of a book about 66 poems for 66 counties? And I mean that seriously because yeah. here in South, I mean, it's a serious question because here in South Dakota, you think, brilliant, I need to have this. In sure. Washington, D.C., do you think quaint? Like what, what is their yeah. response? Yeah. Well, okay, so this is, this is a um, a tough question for me to answer because I because of course the book can't just came out you know and we haven't seen a lot of folks, but when I would mention like for example th this table that I'm using right now was actually purchased with um, my first like whatever royalty check from the poetry, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I told the guy at the market who's like a, he like makes tables from uh from uh down in like uh the blue ridge and he was just like floored he's got 66 poems for 66 south dakota counties i love this and then i talked to him about poet's table which sort of features in one of the county poems which i had covered mouth for the journal and uh so i do think that people there is a kind of mysticism there is a kind of intrigue with south dakota uh and it's rapidly being i think over the last you know year or so it's rapidly being defined in ways that not everyone from south dakota always recognizes and so I do think it's been a fun opportunity to share stories about South Dakota that don't fit through some of the lenses that I think the national press, of whom I am like actually literally a member, like, like oftentimes will filter the state through. Right. All right. For people who haven't uh, read the book as completely as you and I have, we should bring them into the story, which yes. is Rattlesnake Summer, uh, 66 poems for 66 South Dakota counties. And a lot of it um, is things that you wrote or at least began writing on your travels throughout. I mean, these are places where you have stood and things that you have seen. It's not an academic exercise. Tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, so it started when I was a journalist uh, covering the drought in 2017. And I was living in Sioux Falls. But we drove out to uh, Faith, my wife and I, she for work and also me for work. So my editor at the time had said, we want you to cover the drought in, in the Dakotas. I was working for Courthouse News. And uh, we got out there and I just basically had the day to walk around and to interview people at the gas station at, uh, I think the place is called Feedlot is the main eating establishment there in Bison. Uh, we were in, uh, I guess that's Perkins County. We were in Faith right. as well at the gas station. Um, and I asked folks, my, I remember, I vividly remember the first question I asked because I walked in to get some coffee and there were about five or six sort of rancher types who were having coffee folded legs just sort of sitting there chatting and each of them gave me a different year when they thought the drought had been worse <laughs> and so i was like this is see when i had previously been an um an english instructor so i taught college english for a while and you you'd write poetry often about the self right um and or or you would write it about 
texts or manuscripts, documents you could find. And all of a sudden, as a journalist, I thought, whoa, I have access here to real people, to real stories because of my job that I never in a million, I would never have the courage or bravery or gumption to get up and ask random people at a gas station about a drought. Um, but for when it's your assignment, as you know, it's like, I have a deadline. I need to get this done by 5 p.m. today. When was the drought worse? You know, and all of a sudden they come back at you with stories that just struck me as like, these need to be documented somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and as a lover of poetry, they came out in that way. Yeah. In that sense, you, I mean, it, there's very few wandering poets who would come into your town, ask you about the drought. And they say, why do you want to know? Well, I'm a poet. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that, in fact, I was teaching in the fall of 20, what would it have been 2017? I was actually teaching still one more English course at um, University of Sioux Falls. And I taught um, the Japanese poet Basho, who literally would wander around Japan looking for haiku. And so I do have one haiku kind of in uh, ode to him, uh, homage to him, which is for Tripp County, but we don't have to, it's mostly about roadkill. <laughs> but still, there was that element of like, yeah, we are driving from, from county to county. Um, and so I sought out these counties. Some of them I hadn't been to. Uh, some of them I had to cover for work. Some of them I had sort of memories from because my grandmother uh, and my mom's side of the family, they're all McGill's and O'Connor's from Union County, way down mm -hmm. in the southeastern corner. And so I do have like memories of Gary Owen, St. Mary's Church, where my grandma, I, I don't have memories, but I've had family sort right. of memories. So some of that stuff, you know, I, I went to college in Vermilion. So some of this material kind of uh, sort of came to the forefront in this way, but a lot of it was material that I sought for, the, you know, expressly for this project. So are you thinking about being the Basho of South Dakota while you're writing that? I mean, when yeah. you're traveling, the, the academic foundation that you have in that work, does it influence you as you are traveling and writing yeah. poetry? Because that's a very unique thing. Um, yeah. know, knowing that you also studied somebody else who did that is relevant to me. Right. Well, that, okay. So I, I think there are a couple of things that, that should be said. First off, one of, so there is an academic, um, uh, 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 sort of gesture here, or sort of inspiration here. There also, though, is, um, and you've, uh, I think, interviewed my friend Altman Studeni, who mm -hmm. shows up in a couple of the poems. And right. Altman is already, like, he already has that title as, like, South Dakota Basho. Like, he wants, yeah. he, he wants, I didn't know that. Yes. <laughs> and he, I mean, he doesn't, like, I'm just naming him now. I'm like, anoint, like kind of anointing him with that. But he once texted me something about how he wished that he could dissolve into every little corner of the state. And I actually, when I first met him, he read, poems, or he read um, like a sentence review of every single Western art painting at Waldrug. And so that idea of lists or litanies, it's, I think, was implanted in me through that. Um, and so I think, so there, there, there is a kind of marriage here, though, where I think about the academic forms, like there is a sonnet for Charles Mix mm -hmm. County, right? right? And I feel, um, yeah, so there, I don't know, it's, that's a great question. I'll have to keep thinking about this. <laughs> I think I, I think one of the things I enjoy about reading poetry is that you come to a work first as a, as a reader to explore it. And mm -hmm. then when you come back again and again, you start noticing things that you didn't notice before. And so it's nice to know from the poet that there is a trail of you know, breadcrumbs waiting and some of them might be a surprise form or a surprise story mm -hmm. because you've put so much into it um, and we get to discover it over years. Um, yeah. So like to lay out the breadcrumbs a yeah, little bit well, for the reader. <laughs> well, totally. No, totally. And I think that, see, I think, so once, um, so Bob or, or Bruce Roseland, you know, Bruce, Bruce Rose. Okay. So he once uh, early on when uh, he and I met up for coffee and I, and I was reading him some poems and I read him a poem from Douglas County, which is about a gal on a, on a lawnmower. And I spotted one day she was just driving across town. And so I wrote a small little poem about that. And Bruce had told me, he said, you know, uh, you got to make certain that people know what your poems are about. And he's like, I don't really know what this lawn mowing poem is about. <laughs> and I felt like in that moment, I wanted him. I took the criticism first, because I think that's what you do. But secondarily, I thought, I'm thinking about each of these county poems as a tableau, as 66. Mm -hmm poems together. And so there are a lot of pickup trucks that show up. There are a lot of dogs with dissimilar colored eyes. There are um, 
it's a lot of like meditation, I, I hope, on water, the lack of water, and, and how that creates tension in people. Um, and so I think through, you know, there's a lot of, literally a lot of rattlesnakes, <laughs> like sort of show up. Um, so I think hopefully when people do read this, they do take it all in as a, as a work, uh, less so than one individual poem. Although you could do that too. If you want a poem about, you know, Pennington County, there's the Hill City football team. <laughs> right. Um, poetry of place is, uh, you, is something that many poets have tried to explore. You're exploring the poetry of place for an entire state, which is incredibly diverse in different areas. And yet you're trying, so talk a little bit about that sense of, of, of place and trying to define it without being repetitive, but also making those connections that you need to make. Yeah. You must have thought a lot about that mm -hmm. as, and, 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 and it seems to me as a reader that you've solved that conundrum through being specific and be, you know, really telling sure. the, the visual, uh, the sensory details that are right in front of you. But you tell me a little bit more about how you see that. Yeah, so um, when I first had the collection in hand, I had them alphabetized, 66 poems. And I actually also met up with, uh, for coffee with Christine Stewart, uh, who's now a South Dakota Poet Laureate, professor at, at, at State. And she, before she'd even read a poem, I, I told her, yeah, they're all, they're all together, um, all alphabetized. And she like nearly fell out of her chair. And so, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's gonna become tedious, <laughs> like really quickly. <laughs> and so what I thought about, the, like the moment I left there thinking about how to structure these, the idea of structuring around um, the weather and the seasons came in. And so the, the poems are in, they start in summer and then they move fall, winter, spring, and then they end in summer again. And I think that decision allowed for me to bring out some of the natural tensions that I think exist in a place such as South Dakota, where you are in such a tight, um, you know, tenuous relationship oftentimes with the weather, with um, the land, with, you know, in the Plankington poem, there's this idea uh, that 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 the harvest supper is maybe the last time of the of the year that people, people that folks are going to be able to see each other because it's just going to get too cold to kind of go out you know we all kind of hunker down for four months or so and so I think I mean no one should be mistaken that these are that these poems while I try to center other people are certainly my perspective you know like mm -hmm. there are some counties I've spent more time in than others and so I. I, I'm um, ready for somebody from say Trip County to say, why in the world have you made our county poem about roadkill, right? And so, and I, I think that in some, some counties more than others were in service of some broader point. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, so it is my experiences, but I feel like, I mean, the, the state motto is land of infinite variety. And that I think is, is so true in terms of just the state's state's culture, um, the state's geography, state cuisine, <laughs> state, you know, in terms of faith lives are so different. Um, I, you know, and I, I think about even when I was working for the Rapid City Journal, a couple of, a series of pieces I did were just on the sort of resurgence of Lakota language in uh, schools, uh, either, you know, uh, out on Pine Ridge or in Rapid. And I feel like representing all of those aspects of the state's history for me was, was like sort of a guiding star. Yeah. This year, um, during the pandemic, I have thought a lot, as I think many South Dakotans have, about how we are perceived by the outside world, fairly and unfairly. And you also write about this trial um, with the, the uh, uh, can I say pink slime in quotation oh, marks, right? Dude, in quotation yeah. marks, because I can never remember the actual term. Um, Lean, finely textured beef product. Thank you, thank you. And you write about this, you know, in, in a poem, which also brings me back to another time when, you know, the eyes of the world are turned in our way and uh, we don't always have control of how we see our, uh, how we are seen. Mm -hmm. And you do this great moment where you just see things so closely, um, you know, from walking outside the courthouse. It's, you know, it's, it's beyond yeah. the headline, you know, it's in the margins of the reporter's notebook in some way, but that's the, what I want to read. Tell me a little bit yeah. about that, how you see yeah. that. Yeah. 
that that experience was right away when I started working for Courthouse News. They asked me to go to the, you know, the sort of defamation lawsuit trial down in Elk Point. And I had family from Union County, as I said earlier. And so actually in the poem, I talk about a guy who all of a sudden, he, he like mentions Beersford and, I, and I'm like, we go down this rabbit hole of like making connections with cousins and uncles and aunts <laughs> and all that stuff. But it struck me, um, and I think it's become more acutely sensitive to me since living in DC, that the moment that I walked out of that, well, down into the courtroom and all of a sudden you see 20 suits, right? Mm -hmm. And then you walk out and it struck me that I, I thought a lot about the folks who were walking around Elk Point that day looking for lunch, who were maybe working for a national news or they were um, an attorney from DC or Chicago or New York who was in town, you know, what, what are they seeing? And it was that moment when you feel like you see a photo of yourself and you don't recognize it at first almost. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought there was like, it was a mixture of feelings that I had that day because I, I do know that when I was, when I graduated from Vermilion uh, as an undergrad, my grandmother came down, um, Dolores McGill, and we went over to the, um, the old, uh, it's an old like drug store that was in downtown Elk Point, I think mm -hmm. Edgar's or something. I, I can't quite remember the name, but we, you know, it was, it was lovely and it made me think about what Elk Point maybe would have been like a hundred years ago or yeah. 50 years ago when grandma knew it and it was bustling and it was really a hub. And then to see national media come in and to see the town not in those kind of halcyon days and as robust, uh, life is still happening there and it's, and it's fertile and it's complex and all those things. But just the snapshots that maybe sit with those reporters made me a little bit sad and I wanted, and in my small way, to kind of contribute more to the place by telling stories about, like when my great grandfather tried to drop off dogs <laughs> as cadavers for the medical school, and then they like beat him back to the farm. <laughs> you know, just like sort of wild <laughs> tales that like exist anywhere. I don't, you know, yeah. I don't want yeah. So I think we're all, I mean, we're always writing those narratives and those narratives are always being fought over. Yeah. So to me, I would just love those narratives to be more um, complicated and and res and respectful and um, you know, like yeah, pay homage to what is here. And maybe that's the job of the poet. Yeah, I don't. Musicians, artists, sure. you know, yeah, mm -hmm. I, painters. Um, I think, I think, yeah. I mean, let's 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 say a lot for the artists community. I don't think that they get enough said about them in favor. I mean, they provide a good, I think, a good way to to see things new. Um, yeah. What makes a poem a South Dakota poem? What makes what makes a, a moment a poem and what makes a poem a South Dakota poem for you? Yeah, um, I'll answer that through, through this experience because I don't quite know specifically. <laughs> On late, the Friday before Labor Day in 2018, I was driving from Rapid City. I had put in a day of work and I was driving to a cabin, a, a family cabin we have in Northern Minnesota. And I came through Clark. Now the man who published these poems uh, with Badger Clark Publishing uh, is Bob Christensen, and he's from Clark. And so I had a Clark County, County poem already, but I wasn't satisfied with it. I wanted something to be really good for Bob, right? And uh, I was driving through town and I saw uh, a man who was working on a car, like a car was lifted, it was dusk, mm -hmm. and, and the garage door was down. And then I went to this gas station and there was a gal with a squeegee and she was just getting the bugs. You know how the bugs get late summer? They just <laughs> kind of like decoupage <laughs> like your windshield. And something about that, I just felt like that's so quintessentially, you know, if not South Dakota, and that's so quintessentially like, like an upper Midwestern rural life poem. The way that Labor Day is so much a, like a goodbye to the summer, as opposed to DC, like summer lasts until like two weeks ago. I mean, it's just like the weather is so different, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think to me, there's something about the land. There's something about um, sort of a sort of a Spartan quality of things where things are, are, are simply arranged. And yet I also think when I, um, a good poem would always surprise me. And so I felt like, because Friday night, every, for like, 
everyone's at like at the football game, you know? Um, and so the idea that someone was working on their car instead of going to the game to me was also like, that's interesting. Like, you know, so I don't know. That's, that's my shot. That's a tough question, Loria. <laughs> <laughs> you, know. Uh, you know, you asked the question, but you've answered it in your poetry and in your work and in the collection too. I'm making you answer it in an interview, which is unfair. <laughs> no, um, that's why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> Will you read for us something from the book before we say yeah. farewell for now? Yeah. What would you like sure. to read? Um, I'll, I'll read, you know, um, the, the very first poem that I, that I wrote for this collection, uh, which is the first, the very first poem in the book called Dust Cloud and Hand Counting. And I, I think it struck me because these old tales of, of, of like the Great Depression from my grandmother, she would talk about getting up in the morning and they would take a broom to the furniture there in Union County to uh, sweep off the dirt. And then at night she would do the same thing. And so when uh, now my wife Carrie and I were driving through Hand County and we thought we were gonna come into a rainstorm and we were nervous and then we realized because we had the windows down a little bit that it was actually dust. And it felt like it was a time warp and something was opened up in some ways to me in that. So I think I hope, and that created, I think the initial spark for the rest of the collection. So this is dust cloud in Hand County. Brown mists move like rain or a smear across the sky. A detour sign was bent horizontally. The gas station's Bud Light banner ripped and snapped like a Lake Superior tanker before sinking. If you open the window, little pellets in your teeth while lights of oncoming trucks squinted and hovered in the sodden wave. Earlier that day, a man who lived in a trailer and removed his wedding ring rode us out into his fields and pointed, as agents taught him, to where the hay yellow should have reached. The commodity market fell out, he said, the moon slice hanging in the sky. Later, he told us his grandfather had lived near the Missouri before the dam, wide as maybe the truck itself. Now, though, his old hometown is underwater. The wide-eyed, vacant fish float down Maine. The old flagpole at the school, tall and silver beneath the quiet lake. Thank you. The book is called Rattlesnake Summer. Uh, Chris Vondracek is the poet, and uh, we'll put a link up on our website at scpb.org with where you can order the book, but it's badgerclark. What is the? I think it's just badgerclark.com. Badgerclark.com is where yeah. you can order your own copy of 66 uh, poems for 66 counties and Rattlesnake Summer. Chris, thank you so much for being here with us. It's really a great book. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Laurie. It's so wonderful to be on.